Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me. Thanks to the organizers. Um, I generally have a pretty strict no work before 10 a.m. policy, so uh, apologies. I'm still sort of getting my caffeine. Um, so uh, I want to uh, highlight something that, that Ryan pointed out that I think is really important, and that is that um, there's this interesting kind of duality between people being scared about artificial intelligence, what can happen, if it's gonna kill us, uh, you know, just, just give me five years, uh, maybe that'll happen. Um, and then AI practitioners, you know, starting to um, use, use AI, use machine learning in a ton of different um, kind of problems. And I think that one thing to be very aware of is that yes, AI is in its infancy, but that means that we're at a point now where we can help carve out the evolutionary path of AI. There's not one final outcome of AI, right? There's a distribution over all kinds of possible outcomes. And we're in the position right now where we can affect whether the way it evolves, evolves in positive ways, in ways that help people, um, or, uh, or in ways that overlooks people or amplifies human biases. Um, and so asking the question about, you know, will it kill us in five years is, um, is a really, it's, it's an insightful question to ask because it gets at the heart of this problem, which is that how, how can we be sure that the way it's going to end up in, you know, some number of years is a good way? And the answer is that we have to work on this now. We have to be very clear about not only our short-term objectives, like getting a paper, putting out a product, but our long-term objectives. How does this help people? How does this maximize human happiness? How does this um, create uh, you know, ecological stability? Um, so looking out in terms of those long-term goals. Um, so in this talk, I'll be talking a little bit about that. Um, this is some work um, I've been doing um, trying to start paving out an evolutionary path for artificial intelligence that will get it to a place um, where it does not amplify, amplify human injustice. Okay, so take this image here. What do you see? Anyone, what do you see? Bananas. Any others? Bananas on store, maybe. Uh, someone said bananas with stickers. Yeah. Oh, dole, yeah, I don't have that one. I, <laughs> sorry. Fruit, very good. Um, what you notice is that uh, no one mentions this, right? No one mentions that they're yellow bananas. Um, if you see something like this, people will tend to mention, oh, those are green bananas, or maybe they'll infer from the green, oh, those are unripe bananas. If you see something like this, people will tend to say they're ripe bananas or something like they're bananas with spots. Or if you're me, you might think, oh, those are, those are bananas that are good for banana bread. Um, but when you see something that corresponds to your stored prototype of that item, you tend not to mention the things that are most typical about it, the things that you perceive to be most within that prototype. Um, and so yellow tends not to be mentioned because our stored understanding of bananas kind of implies yellow. So it goes without saying. Um, so let's take this a little bit further to a very human case. Um, this is a riddle that uh, probably a lot of people know. Um, a man and his son are in a terrible accident and are rushed to the hospital in critical care. The doctor looks at the boy and, expla and exclaims, I can't operate on this boy. He's my son. How could this be? Well, it turns out that the doctor is his mom. It's a female doctor. Um, but when you hear the word doctor, um, regardless of you know, how, how open-minded you are, you'll tend to think of a man. Um, and a study was done on this at Boston University, and they found that the majority of test subjects overlooked the possibility that the doctor is a she, including men, women, and self-described feminists. Um, this problem is um, integrated throughout everything we do. 
So if we want to do world learning from text, for example, we'll find that the frequency with which different things are mentioned are not reflective of real world frequencies. So um, this is a project on world learning from 2013 where they were trying to estimate um, how likely different common human things were like blinking and breathing. And what they found is that just based on text-based, web-based frequencies, the probability of murder is almost 10 times higher than the probability of blinking, right? Because blinking tends to go without saying. Murder is much more sort of exciting or much more evocative. And this is the problem of human reporting bias. And that's the frequency with which people write about actions, outcomes, or properties is not a reflection of real world frequencies or the degree to which a property is characteristic of a class of individuals, but more, having more to do with their stored notions of things, the things they've learned by being in the culture. Um, so how does this affect machine learning and AI? Well, when we start, we have training data. Um, and then these tend to be collected, annotated. We then use this to train a model. Um, from there, we can uh, filter media, rank it, aggregate it, generate it. And then from there, people see the output. But just at the initial step of data collection, just at the initial step of looking at data, there are tons of human biases that are already um, concomitant with the data. So things like reporting bias, things like selection bias, overgeneralization, stereotypical bias, historical unfairness, implicit associations, prejudice, group attribution error. And then in collecting and annotating, there are even further kinds of biases that creep in. So things like sampling error, um, blind spots, um, anecdotal fallacy, correspondence bias, confirmation bias, which is a huge problem. Um, and all of these things are input to the training data that we start to use in our machine learning systems. The pipeline goes through. But actually what we have is human bias very strongly coming in at the very start of this pipeline, and it's propagated throughout the model. This is a bias network effect, where bias data created from from this process becomes then the new training data. And over time, we can actually amplify human biases. The thing about bias, though, is that it's a systematic deviation from foreground truth. And there are a couple things here that are interesting mathematically. It's systematic, and there's some foreground truth that's hidden, that's latent. And this can be used as a signal. So I'm going to talk a bit about one approach to starting to model these kinds of biases in vision and language. Um, it's just sc scratching the surface, but starting to get at actually modeling what the human biases are that we're learning and accounting for it at train time. So there's data everywhere. Big data is the sort of bread and butter of machine learning. But there are not a lot of labels to train on. Um, exhaustively annotated data is expensive. You might find something like this picture on the left where you have dog, chair, pizza, donut. Um, the image on the right uh, is something you would ideally have if you wanted to do full world learning uh, for an artificially intelligent agent where you have things carefully partitioned off, you have exhaustive labels of all the different things going on. But that's a far cry from what we tend to have, and even getting that is extremely expensive to get. So in a simple image classification pipeline where we're trying to use these kinds of labels to learn about the world, we have an input image, and maybe we have some vocabulary that we're interested, things like banana and yellow. Um, we train a convolutional neural network, it passes through um, generally sort of a sigmoid or softmax, um, and it gives this output, things like banana and yellow. But we'll find that when training in this kind of setting, we'll actually be penalized at train time for predicting yellow. This is going to um, increase our loss at train time because yellow hasn't been unmentioned, even though the model is getting it right. Um, so the model starts to learn 
not what's true, but what humans say. And those are two very different things. But a human bias prediction can be factored into some different terms. There's, for example, the presence of something. Is the concept visually present? And there's the relevance. Is the concept relevant for a human to mention? And using this function, we can actually start to build up a somewhat uh, well-informed latent model of the world. The basic idea is that um, given the presence or not, will a human tend to mention it with two separate factors where one is guessing if the concept is present or not, and the other one guessing uh, if it is present, will it be relevant for a human to generate, to say? Um, and this creates a latent model of the visually correct ground truth by using the actual human labels as a sort of distant supervision. The end-to-end -end approach here is to use these two sort of models, the visual presence and the relevance, and marginalize over both terms in order to get at the downstream prediction. This is sort of basic uh, latent variable modeling, where you want to try and maximize the likelihood of your training data, but in order to do that, you have to pass through your beliefs about what is actually there but might not be mentioned. From here, we can get to a point where we might see doctor, but we know that inherently it's male and it's unmentioned. And we might see female doctor, and we know that in this case it tends to be mentioned. And so even learning from sort of human bias data, we can start unpacking the kinds of implicit assumptions that are already there. Okay, that's me, thanks. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Yep. Yeah, and different languages have, um, for example, um, gendered. Oh, um, so the question was, um, have I looked at other languages? Um, because languages have different, um, different kinds of morphology, should I say, for, for male, female, things like that. Yeah. Um, and so, um, so I haven't looked at modeling this, this stuff in another language, um, but I think that the, the idea that something is gendered or not gendered isn't really gonna change the, the basics of what you're modeling and what you're not modeling. I mean, um, in either case, you have some idea of the kinds of things that might not be mentioned and the kinds of things that, that can be mentioned. Do you disagree? Do you want to un unpack that a little? Or? She blurs male and female, yeah. Right, and so all the more reason to have a latent idea of what the male and female might be, right? And that's exactly the kind of model you could build up. English is actually, um, I think, a useful language to do this in, specifically when it comes to gender, because we don't tend to have a lot of gendered pronouns. But in my example case, I mentioned bananas, for example, right? So gender is one thing of many. You could also think about race, you could also think about religion, you could also think about unpacking it to all kinds of things that tend not to be mentioned, um, but are implicit in the different words that people use.
Yeah, yeah, it's true. And, and so I think that one of the, the best ways to sort of deal with this is just to be aware of it. Because, for example, in this case, if we're trying to learn what a doctor looks like, we're an AI agent, trying to learn what a doctor looks like, um, we'll learn that doctor and male look similar, right? That they're kind of similar looking things. And so um, by exposing what these sort of like underlying things are, it doesn't mean that we've solved the problem, but it means that now the machine is aware of what the problem is, right? And so from there, it can make decisions based on sort of the, the AI practitioner, what you want to do from there. Um, for example, you might ask a question. Um, is it a male doctor, female doctor? Um, right? And you can, you can guide the intelligence to understand humans, but still pull out these other kinds of things that humans are baking into it, and maybe even further engage in conversation around those kinds of things. Um, it also helps with um, trying to start unpacking decision making. So one thing that's really difficult about deep learning is that, um, as, as Ryan also mentioned, it tends to be pretty opaque. Um, so you have some downstream uh, prediction and you kind of don't know all the, all the sort of variables involved in trying to figure out that decision. Um, by exposing some sort of latent signals here, we can uh, get to, a, ooh, sorry, we can get to a point where the system um, can actually provide some reasoning about this kind of thing. Like, well, we've recognized in the data that, oh, we've recognized in the data, for example, that um, this person is, you know, this kind of gender, this kind of race, something like that. And we actually think that that's a high probability of X. And then in that case, you can actually know if it's making a prejudicial or stereotypical decision. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, let me go back to that if it can take that. Right. Um, so the relevance model um, is basically, I need to explain something very technical if that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so bear with me. Um, so um, in order to do this, it's a little bit tricky because um, there's a question about like how, the, how you can pick up that signal, how you can tell like when something is uh, present versus when it's relevant. And so one way to do this is actually to tie um, the presence and the relevance to the human downstream um, predictions, to, to the human words for the first couple epochs. And then once it started to get a signal within those uh, training epochs, then you can start um, moving out the human signal as, um, uh, as, the, as the signal for the relevance and the visual presence. Now it can just be the downstream um, human, human prediction. So you have a little bit of a model for both uh, from initial training. And then once it started picking up a signal, um, you can have it uh, start building up further latently. Does it make sense? Yeah, okay, cool. Any other questions? Yes. So the question is if the model um, would be able to um, tell the difference between different presumptions um, when thinking about different languages, different ways of talking about things, different perspectives in talking about things. Is that an accurate recapitulation? Of, um, let's see. So, you, so in that case, the downstream utterance uh, is something that is different between two people. So one person says X and one person says Y. 
I think in both cases, you actually want something that, that latently models all the similarities. Um, there's, there's been some really cool work showing that if you um, include a model of the speaker, um, you can do well at um, creating language or um, estimating language that are, is particular to a speaker. And so in that case, um, your relevance classifier would actually have to have another term that also corresponds to the specific person talking about it. The latent, uh, the latent things that actually exist would still be the same, but the, but the relevance um, factor itself um, could additionally include um, a sort of speaker identity that would then help decide, you know, given this speaker, we say it, given the other speaker, we don't say it, even though the same ground truth is there, the same full ground truth. It's just realized in different ways. One more question. Yeah, well, it's interesting you say that. It, well, in this particular case, bananas have to be green before they're yellow, right? So I'd say that there's at least as many green bananas existing. Yeah, I get, I get your point, though. Um, so, so she's asking about um, the, the fact that there are majority effects in the data set, that it might be the case that some things just tend to be true. Um, here's one example that I've been working with. Um, tenured professors um, are largely male. Um, and so um, if you're trying to learn sort of what a tenured professor looks like, you'd actually um, be somewhat correct to see it as somewhat male because that's really what the data is showing. Um, the problem with um, sort of using this, whether or not it's a human bias or not, um, in a machine learning system, is that a machine learning system tends to be trained by a maximum likelihood estimation, which means that um, it starts to overgeneralize. So you might have a distribution that's like 80% uh, male, 20% female. Um, after going through maximum likelihood estimation, estimation, your distribution of outcomes would be something like 90% male, 10% female, or even worse. Um, so these kinds of things get amplified through the system. Um, and so whether it's coming from the way things are or the way people mention things um, sort of doesn't matter too much. Both of them will affect the machine's perception of the world. Um, and, and both of them can be modeled at train time. Okay, great. Thanks, guys. <laughs>